Hello, my name's Richard Felix, and over the past year, I've been conducting the national ghost tour of Great Britain. We've visited many, many haunted sites, and a lot of those sites have been either inns or pubs. Now, it's not just the spirits behind the bar that make them so haunted. I think it's the fact that these places were, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, very much hives of activity. Everything went on within the pub or the inn. Doctors' surgeries were held here, veterinary surgeries. Courts were convened and held, and even people executed, sometimes inside the inn. Of course, you must also remember that these coaching inns especially were havens for highwaymen. They would be inside the pub or the inn watching the mail coach to see how much gold, silver or bullion was loaded. Watching the people inside, seeing how fat the purses were, and then sometimes following them out and robbing them on the highway, or perhaps creeping up to the bedroom in the middle of the night and relieving them of that purse. Murders took place, and of course suicides. I think that's one of the reasons that these places are so haunted. So what we're going to show you now are some of the best clips from that National Ghost Tour of Great Britain, featuring the most haunted inns and pubs. So settle back, turn down those lights, give us your full attention, and let us take you on a tour of some of the most haunted inns and pubs in Great Britain. The Haunted Bell, probably the best preserved coaching inn in Derby. This is what coaching inns looked like in the 18th century. And because so much went on in coaching inns, and I'm talking of people living there, of, of highwaymen literally waiting in the buildings, watching people with the money, watching the mail coach coming in and out. Doctors' surgeries were held in coaching inns, um, veterinary surgeries, um, you name it, everything went on. Courts were held here. And so, of course, the, there's got to be ghosts. There's lots of ghosts in this building. There's a grey lady in the Mortgage Advice Bureau here, or should I say the ghost of a grey lady, that uh, haunts the Mortgage Advice Bureau here. There's a poltergeist in this bar here. Anyway, the best bit of this place, the haunted bedroom. After it was no longer a coaching inn, then the staff would sleep on the top floor, right at the top here, in the attic rooms. And room 29, the room on the right-hand side, haunted by the ghost of a serving wench, reputedly murdered by the Jacobites, by Bonnie Prince Charlie's soldiers in 1745. But there's nothing to substantiate the story, but the girl in that room has been seen twice in connection with children. And here we are, walking up the original staircase of the old bell, right to the top, to the gods. And at the top here of the landing, the notorious Room 29. Still got its original oak door and porcelain number. Here it is, 2929. Behind here is where the ghost of a young serving wench has been seen on frequent occasions. She was reputedly murdered by the Jacobites in 1745. But there are other stories to go with it. Um, a few years ago, a medium from Sheffield came here. She'd never been in this building before, and she went into this room, said there was a dreadful icy coldness about it. And she sensed a girl with a throat cut lying in the corner of the room. But she said even worse than that, next door she sensed a man a very evil man wearing a grey sort of overall with a bald head and he was standing in the corner of the room holding a knife dripping blood. Welcome to room 29. 
the haunted bedroom of the bell. An awful lot of folks on the ghost walk have heard about this room, but very few people have been in it. Very few people have seen in here. This is the room that is the most haunted part of this building. After it was no longer a coaching inn, this room was the bedroom of the landlord's son. The boy was a very bad asthmatic, and in the middle of the night, mum and dad heard the boy choking, coughing and reaching. Dad rushed into the boy's room to find the boy out of bed, bent forward, choking and coughing. But standing over him was a ghostly apparition of a girl wearing a white mob cap and starched apron. She was stood over the boy, patting him on the back, trying to relieve his suffering. Dad came in and the ghost vaporized and vanished. 30 years later, totally different family using this room again. The landlady was using it as a nursery. She was changing a baby's nappy in here. And all she did was turn away from the baby to get either nappy pins or, or cotton wool. And as she turned back, she'd been substituted. There was another girl standing over the baby, a girl with a white mob cap and starched apron, bending over the baby to pick it up. Mother screamed and plunged her hands through the apparition to pick the baby up and draw it through the ghost. She clutched the baby close to her and ran out of the building, clutching the baby. As she turned back, she saw that the apparition was still there, bent over the baby, which of course was no longer there. The mother left and changed nurseries. I think if it had been me, I'd have put in for a transfer and I'd have changed inns. Here we are above the stables in the bell yard. This area up here was used by the stable boys, the bestraw up here, and the stable boys, the lowest of the low, of course, had to sleep on straw up here. And people have said that they've seen the ghost of a little boy sitting up here, looking at the people down here. This is uh, probably a room where either the coachman or the drivers would sleep at night if they were having an overnight sleep here in Derby before taking the coach, the early morning coach in the morning. And through here, incredible door here, of course, um, cut out to fit the rafters. Cheers. I'm in the middle of Annick, North East England. I found a fantastic old pub called The Cross. The word Anik comes from Aln, A-L-N, which is Celtic for Bright River, and Wick, which is a Saxon word for homestead or farmstead. It's obviously pronounced Anik. It was originally given to the De Vecchi family by William the Conqueror. The cross of the De Vecchi family is still up here on the wall of this pub, which of course is called the cross. But the family later disappeared and the Percy family took over Annick Castle. The huge castle which we're hopefully going to visit in a few minutes was a bastion for many many years against Scottish invasion. There's an incredible story here. Uh, as I was looking for the pub earlier I asked a gentleman in the marketplace, could you tell me where the cross is? He said oh yes dirty bottles and I said yes that's quite correct and here apparently this part of the pub was originally a wine merchant's and over 150 years ago a wine merchant on the inside of the pub was making a display of bottles wine bottles he collapsed presumably with a heart attack and died and his wife sealed off the window and left bottles exactly as they were moments after her husband died and the legend has it that anyone who disturbs these wine bottles will die I'm inside the cross now approaching the back of the window here with the dirty bottles and are they dirty there's cobwebs there's dust broken glass old broken 
barrels, you name it, all here. No one to this day has dared touch these bottles. I asked the landlord if there is a ghost as well, and, and he's told me that although he's seen nothing, the chap that runs the pub for him when he's away is terrified of staying alone. He hears footsteps upstairs, voices down here, when of course the pub's closed, and he said although he enjoys running the pub, he hates staying here alone. Um, on this actual window here, I've noticed that there's actually a, a slider on the sash that you could lift it, but I'm certainly not going to lift it. And I'm also not going to stand here too long, just in case. And I'm now in the centre of Lancaster, behind me, Lancaster Castle, and here, the second oldest pub in England, the Three Mariners. It's built into the rock. It's one of only three pubs in this country that has a cellar upstairs. Also in that cellar is a freshwater stream running through it and would you believe it a ghost so let's go in and have a look this place has been here since 1213 absolutely incredible old place and of course when bonnie prince charlie's soldiers came through lancaster I wonder how many of them were billeted here in this building. They have a ghost downstairs, funnily enough a ghost that stands here behind the bar. They say it's the ghost of a man, they don't know who it is. Whether it's an old landlord that loved the building and still haunts it, nobody knows. But the latest sighting of a ghost was actually by the landlady's son and it was upstairs upstairs in the cellar. Let's go and see it. And this is quite incredible. I have never seen anything like this before. You actually climb up this metal ladder to get into the cellar. And I've never climbed up into a cellar before. And behind me, of course, the hoist to actually lift the beer barrels up into the cellar rather than rolling them down or dropping them down quite amazing here is the stream water running through here algae of course all green it runs down here you can see that i'm standing in the water and there are little holes here for the water to disappear and it flows away down here and down the drain and whether it's water that, that attracts a ghost up here, I don't know. But literally here, standing in the middle of the room, one day, Graham, the son of the landlady, was up here fetching ice, came back downstairs, of course, and said to his mum, Mum, I've just seen a ghost. And he saw the figure of a man standing here, right in the middle of this cellar. And I would imagine that he beat a hasty retreat just as I'm going to do now. And I shall now go downstairs out of the cellar. And even more ghost stories. Um, the old pool room, which was uh, through there, used to have obviously a table in it, it hasn't any more. And apparently people used to see the balls rolling around the table when nobody was there, nobody got a cue, nobody was knocking them. There was a ghost in the ladies' toilets. And I think probably for the first time in my life, I'm uh, off up to the ladies' room to have a look. Now, it's uh, surprising, actually, because when people talk ghosts and toilets, it's always rather tongue-in-cheek people usually laugh but 
you'd be surprised while we've been doing this tour just how many toilet ghost stories there are. And I'm now sadly in the ladies' toilet. And um, on frequent occasions, customers, ladies, come downstairs, come back to the bar, and they say to the landlady, I've seen the ghost in the ladies' toilets. And luckily, it's the ghost of a lady. And a welcome stop on the way on the Royal Mile. I'm in the, the Mitre. It's a public house that stands on the site of Bishop Spottiswood's tenemented house here. He was the Bishop of St Andrews and had this fine house built here in 1615. It's got ghosts. It's a possibility that the Bishop is very unhappy because his house was demolished, this house was built, and of course it's been turned into a den of iniquity. It's a public house and restaurant. Even in the menu of the Mitre is the story of the ghostly goings-on. It happens mostly around the staircase and on the stairs to the cellars and staff report that there's always an icy chill as if they're not alone when they're going down the stairs and an incident that happened when two members of staff were actually in the cellar changing beer barrels the place was actually closed and for absolutely no reason at all the jukebox came on for no reason at all it was very loud they came upstairs to see who was here who'd done it and of course the place was shut up there was nobody around so they switched it off and went back downstairs carried on with their work and of course you know what I'm going to say it came on again they came back upstairs still nobody there and so they beat a hasty retreat until the landlord arrived. I'm in Westgate, in the centre of Lincoln, outside the Strugglers Inn. It's called the Strugglers because it's in view of the castle and the area where the public executions took place. Until a Lincolnshire executioner called William Marwood introduced the long drop, which broke the neck, men and women struggled for up to quarter of an hour before they finally expired, much convulsed. And there is a ghost story here at the pub. A Norton Disney poacher called William Clark was a regular at this pub. He shot a gamekeeper in the legs. The gamekeeper died of gangrene and William Clark was hanged for his murder. Before he was hanged, he presented his lurcher dog to the landlord, William Roberts. Roberts kept the dog for many years and when it died, he had it stuffed and mounted. And it was displayed until the early 1970s in the bar. On a cold, windy night, many of the regulars of this pub say that even to this day, while they're standing at the bar with their pints, they can sense a large dog brush past their legs. Is that William Clark's lurcher? No one will ever know. This is one of the most haunted crossroads in Oxfordshire. It's on the A4260 and behind me a very, very old coaching inn called Hopcroft's Holt. It's got lots of haunted bedrooms and it's also haunted by a famous highwayman, a Frenchman who came over after the restoration of King Charles II 
his name, Claude Duval. So let's go inside and explore. Now inside the reception of Hot Cross Holt, the whole area is themed with pictures of the building as it was and of course pictures of highwaymen. But it's not only haunted by a highwayman. There are quite a few stories to do with the bedrooms upstairs. So come and join me. Let's go and have a look. And I'm now entering one of the haunted bedrooms. This is room number three. And I suppose the vast majority of the hauntings tend to go on here. This, of course, is in the old original part of the building, which goes back actually to the 1400s. And there are various things that have happened to customers. Nothing, nothing horrible. Um, one lady and gentleman asleep one night, and all of a sudden they felt the bedclothes being tugged from the bottom and they were actually pulled halfway off them. But strangely enough, all they did was pull the bedclothes back up, as you do. Next morning, of course, went down and, and just mentioned it to the reception. And they said, oh yeah, which, which room were you in? Room number three. Oh yes, they said, yes. The haunted bedroom. And I'm actually in the bridal suite, room number 25, coming out of this, well, absolutely magnificent bathroom, four poster bed, if any room should be haunted, by Jove, well, this one should be. But um, apart from the fact that we've had to change frequency uh, on the camera and the mic because we can't get a signal, and I've already had two phone calls in this room and both of them have vanished. There is no signal, so there's something going on in here. But apparently room 24 next door is active at the moment. And they're telling me that the maids won't actually work on their own. Things are happening. They're hearing footsteps while they're in there. Windows, they can hear opening and closing. And on two occasions, when there was no one in the room, one of the maids came in to find the curtains drawn closed and she knows for a fact that she'd drawn them open so they've got to the stage now where it's a case of well let's go and do room 24 but I'm not going alone I'm walking along the 60s corridor known as that because the rooms are numbered 60 um, I'm up in the gods. This is uh, the attic rooms, and there's a, there's a feel about it. Apparently, the waitresses and the maids won't come up here, don't like coming up here alone. And a lady called Tanya, who was the wife of the chef, who used to live up here, she reported cold spots, a presence, even when she was alone, she never felt as if she was. It seemed as if there was someone with her. She doesn't live up here now, but apparently she more or less refuses to come up here. And certainly under no circumstances will ever come alone. She has to be accompanied by somebody living. I'm sitting inside the original part of Hot Cross Holt, this old ancient coaching inn, only 10 miles from the centre of Oxford on the crossroads. It's reputedly haunted by the ghost of a highwayman called Claude Duval, this famous highwayman that worked Hampstead Heath on many occasions, but used this building, A, 
as his base and B, to rob many coaches that passed by at this crossroads. On one occasion, quite a famous occasion, he held up the London stagecoach. On it was a gentleman and a beautiful looking woman. The gentleman came out and was about to take his purse out to give it to Duval when his wife started to play a flute. She was still sitting in the coach. Duval was so taken with it that he actually asked one of his henchmen to take the flute off the young lady and play it while he asked the lady to dance with him in the moonlight while the husband was looking on. At the end of it, he asked for payment and took 100 guineas off the lady's husband. From then on, Duval used to travel with a musician just in case he met another beautiful lady to dance with. But Duval's last dance was at Tyburn in 1670 when he danced a jig at the end of the hangman's rope and was buried in St Paul's in Covent Garden. His gravestone is gone, but we do have a copy of the inscription. Here lies Duval. Reader, if male thou art, look to thy purse. If female, to thy heart. Much havoc has he made of both for all. Men he made stand, and women he made fall. The second conqueror of the Norman race, knights to his arms did yield, and ladies to his face. Old Tyburn's glory, England's illustrious thief, Duval, the lady's joy, Duval, the lady's grief. And to this very day, Claude Duval still haunts this inn and has been seen on many occasions sitting in this very chair here. In fact, only a fortnight ago, I was told there was a conference here and a lady walking through to the bar asked the barman, what was that reenactor doing sitting in the chair? He looked like a highwayman. What a quaint idea for an inn like this, she said. Oh no, madam, the barman said. We don't employ reenactors. That was the ghost of Claude Duval. And I'm standing in the car park of the old Stork Hotel, now known as the Stork Inn. The building goes back, they believe, possibly to the 14th century. It says on the door, 1752. It's got the ghost of a royalist soldier, a cavalier. This place was used as a prison. It was known for a period of time as the Tower Prison. Parts of it are still preserved underneath the building. And during the English Civil War, Royalist soldiers were imprisoned here. One of them died from mistreatment by Cromwell's soldiers here at the inn. And his ghost still haunts this building to this day. There have been many reported sightings when it was a hotel. Very, very loud footsteps clonking along the landing, so loud that they actually woke up some of the guests in the night. And a cavalier a royalist has been seen around the building on many occasions in the bar walking up and down the stairs still got the original staircase in it and one gentleman a customer at the pub went to the gents toilets and was standing washing his hands and noticed in the mirror a cavalier standing behind him it made him jump he turned thinking that it was just a, a chap that was off to a fancy dress party and he watched it 
vaporized. It just vanished and disappeared in front of him. Now, the amazing thing is that an awful lot of people believe when they first see a ghost that it's a real person, just like the gentleman in the toilets. He didn't sort of jump backwards terrified because he'd seen a ghost. He just converted it straight to reality, as people do. Thought he was going to a fancy dress party. And people frequently do this. They think that the, 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 the ghost or the, the apparition that they've seen is, is their dad coming in the room, um, doctor so-and-so off the other shift, um, something like that. It's only when they do something strange, like walking through the world, disappearing, vanishing, vaporizing, as the ghost did here, that they actually realize that they've seen a ghost. Um, the original road goes down here, and round the corner, you can actually still see the original mullion windows of the old building. One here, now at ground level, almost disappeared, and round the corner here, even better ones of the original window. And this is part of the cellar, the prison underneath that you can see from the other side. And all of this is the original part. Probably the ghost is, for want of a better word, recorded into the fabric of this building. The stone does tend to hold events a little bit like a cassette player. It's really no different to pressing the play button of a cassette player, of a video recorder, and you see the event again. But there's no doubt about it that the old Stork Hotel here at Billinge is a very, very haunted building. And the landlord has very kindly let me half demolish his cellar, um, because apparently there's a tunnel down here, and the original cells where the royalist prisoners were actually incarcerated is through here. I've taken all this down, we've had to move all this. We've uh, taken the light off the video camera so we could actually go in and have a look. And, um, well, this is where all the ghostly things seem to emanate from, so we'll go in and have a look. I don't know what I'm going to see around this corner, so uh, uh, I'm a little bit or slightly apprehensive, to say the least. But here we go. Oh my God, is this old. And uh, just showing the light so the cameraman can see where he's coming. And uh, in we go. It's very wet, very muddy. Oh my goodness. And through here is the original prison where the prisoners were kept. The royalist prisoners were actually chained to the walls down here. They've told me that somewhere around there are chains still on the walls. I can't see any. You can see the original old mullion windows here that are now below the level of the road, which is outside. And this apparently is the original bench or thrall where they used to sit on for hours and hours. And of course, it was down here that one of the royalist prisoners died possibly from jail fever, I would think, or something like that, the stench, which, of course, was a form of typhus. Um, it's cold down here, it's wet, and there is quite a, an unnatural feeling down here. Not somewhere that I'd like to stay for very long, I'll be honest, but uh, I've had enough. I think we'll uh, beat a hasty retreat out of here. to the light. I'll switch this off. And I'll now put the tunnel back to what it was and replace the cellar. And this is the Belgrave Triangle. Over here we've got the churchyard. There's a grey lady in it. There's the hall here, which of course we've already been in. And with me is the landlady of the local pub, the Tolbert. Lynn Deacon, and you've actually not only had experiences, ghostly experiences, in the pub, but you've actually seen something 
here at the hall, have you? Yes, I have. Um, it was one night we came out to check because there were lights on and we were very concerned because nobody told us anything was going off at the hall. Mm. Does anybody live in it? Or? No, no, it is right. it's empty, but obviously it's secured up. Yeah. And we're the only people around here that are around here 24 hours that of can course. monitor yeah. anything. Yeah. And there were no cars outside, but there were certain lights on and I wasn't happy and I couldn't see anybody, so I really paid attention to the windows. Yeah. And one of the nets was open and there were lights in this particular room and whenever I moved, the lights moved with me. They didn't alter, they continued. Really? And they were really, really bright. That's this, That's these, this, the, this, the middle this window, window here. It's there. the ladies' yeah. drawing room, I understand. Yeah. But then I went over and looked in the main bedroom windows and one of, as you can see now, the, the curtains were tucked back with the tie backs. Yeah. Well, yeah. one of the tie backs in the right hand window was, was off and the curtain was closed. And I couldn't understand it because I could see lights coming off the hall in the main hallway. Yeah. And that's not possible, I'm told, with the switching system they've got in there. The lights are on for the different rooms. But you can't have some lights on and some lights off. Yeah. And the two spotlights that are in the ladies' drawing rooms wouldn't have moved. And automatically, when they're on, there's a strip light on, but there was no strip light on. And when they put, we tried to recreate it one night um, when we had a vigil with ASAP, mm. and they couldn't. The lights weren't bright enough. Really? So what sort of lights? I mean, they were, it wasn't candlelight, I presume. Was it? it was. No, it was a very, or? very bright, intense circular light that did not fade in its strength as I moved. Yeah. And of course, I was moving because I was desperately looking for somebody well, to wave course, at me and say, course, "Hi, yeah. Lily. It's only us. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. not to worry about." Um, it just didn't happen and we couldn't explain it and of course when we went then further to look at things the tie backs are never altered mm. they are as they are now yeah, yeah. and the net curtains are sewn together and, and have that's been what they for told years. Inside, they said they're actually sewn together and there's no way that anyone yeah it was as if the, one of them had been open and it was if a cat had perhaps walked on the window ledge yeah. and caught one up um, but they were most because I paid so much attention to what I was looking for I know what I saw yeah. Um, yeah. They can't explain it. And of course, the other thing was an intense light coming from the back of the building. And as At the I same time? Yeah. And as really? I stepped right back to stand by these gates just to really look in the top windows, yeah. it was very, very dark. It was like quarter to 12 at night. Yeah. And there was this intense light coming from the back of the building as if every single security light from Filbert Street Football Club was switched was on. Um, and even with the security lights they've got there, it wouldn't, wouldn't have that created light. that intense light. They, they tried to recreate that as well and they couldn't. Wow. So. Well, let's, shall we go down and have a look at, yeah. uh, at your place? Because I, I know for a fact that you, you from over the years, of course, had well, many, many um, occurrences have taken place. Yes. In your, your place, of course. But it's very, very old, isn't it? It is. I mean, it goes back to the 11th century. Yes, um, that's old. That's old. The existing building that you see now from the road is probably only two or three hundred years old but it's still in an altered state because it's only got two stories now above ground and it was three really yeah and it was a coaching in so there was an awful lot and it was a really big busy business yes, of course. Um, yeah. in 1752 at the death of one person the contents of the pub alone were valued at over a hundred pounds a lot of money isn't that's it? a lot so of money um, so it's, it's seen a lot of history it had stables at the back um, Prior to its main alterations, you had the three stories, you had people living yeah. on the, yeah. the top two stories, and your staff would have lived in a oh, cellar. Yeah. We do know, there's 99% sure there was a brewery at the back, yeah. and it brewed beer for the other local pubs. Um, but it has seen an awful lot of strange so things going on. So much life and on. death carried yes, on in, yes. in a coaching in the, my um, over the years. The garage, we understand, at one point was the village mortuary. Oh, wonderful. Um, we Does haven't it bother seen you when you get your car out at night. No. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing has ever bothered me about this pub. It's so friendly and welcoming and even when I've been here on my own in the middle of the night, there's a certain amount of security and, and friendliness about the feeling of the whole building. And I mean after all I'm just looking after it in a part of time. Of course you are. And anything that is here that has been here in the past that should have in normal circumstances passed over. Yeah. Um 
They've never done anything to hurt me. Why should they? I'm looking after it in a traditional manner, and as long as they're they, happy they, with it, they're they going to let me get on with it. They don't bother. Most people I speak to, to be quite honest with you, have never been frightened. No, There's no. a little bit concerned or shocked or sometimes made jump by the fact yes. that that person... But they usually think, A, it's a real person that does something strange, mm. like disappearing through the wall. But most people, all you are, are really are custodians That's of right. the building, looking after it for, you know, yeah, for others. Yeah, uh, and we find that... <laughs> The customers expect it to be haunted. They, they accept well, it as part of life. Yeah. People will come in and say, I drank here 40 years ago when I was a youth and I first started drinking around the pubs. And they'll tell you stories about the pub. And they won't just tell you stories about history of the pub. They'll tell you stories about things they've seen. Yeah. And we just take it all in. We have yeah. no choice but to do, do otherwise. Of course you do. But, uh, Shall we go Yeah, and let's go and have a look. Fine. <laughs> Good job you've got a nice warm fire. <laughs> <laughs> and is this where they're attracted? I mean, do they do they ghosts appear in front of the fire, or, or is it all over the place? It's all over the place, to be honest. We've got a little boy that's been seen a couple of times on what used to be a piano stool to a little organ in the corner there. That was seen by a previous landlady. The same lady saw the face of a man, which was heavily disfigured through the corridor here. Yeah. Before the alterations to the pub were done, this was the bar area, mm -hmm. and we've got one previous landlord who saw a man on more than one occasion, and he was saw, saw by his brother as well, walking in what was the original entrance to the pub. Yeah, because obviously it's had lots of different That's entrances right. and lots um, of alterations. Getting a little bit of money out of an old string purse, and then walking through the wall into this room and disappearing. Yeah. And at one point, a, a very elderly customer did actually tell that landlord the name of the person and who it was. Really? And that they'd passed on. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We've had instances um, where noises have been heard, but they've usually been in the bar. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if we want to go through to the bar, I can show you what one very important person actually did say. Yeah, um, that's all right with you. Yeah, yeah not great. a problem. <laughs> Okay, if you just mind the steps, yes, can I just put the ceiling and the wall on? It's quite a big place, isn't it? It is. Oh, yeah. mm. Right, um, we had one night where we had a vigil with ASAP, yes. and we were actually having some filming being done upstairs. Myself and um, my behalf were upstairs, locked in our room with our dog, asleep. Yep. Yep. And the chairman, National of ASAP, tells me he walked into this room just to check yep. and stood about where the till is and looked ahead of him and he saw a man walk from this doorway yes. down here and down to this area here where right. there used to be, um, until recently, a Skittles table. Yes. And you think, well, there are windows in this room. You could have got out. Yep, yep. Those windows are screwed shut. Right. The only exits from the room were locked. Yep. And there were only four people in the building from ASAP at the time. One gentleman, within literally three or four seconds, came down and greeted the chairman and said, I've changed the tape. And he said, you've just walked across in front of me. And he said, no. Mm -hmm. They came and checked here, and then they both together went through to the lounge where the other two members of ASAP were, were sitting, having a break between the vigils, and they were chatting, and they'd seen or heard nothing and hadn't moved from the spot from when the chairman had come out of the room. So they were not able to explain who it was. We haven't, for sensitivity reasons, been able to really investigate who it might no, have been, no, but there was a landlord that died here that within reason would fit the description of the person that was seen. Really? Um, but we don't like to upset people. Yeah, <laughs> some of his family is still yes, alive. Yes, that's so. right. Some of the family is still yeah. alive, so we've left it. Yeah. Some of the landlords are buried in the graveyard, is that right? That's right, yes. And we've had instances where noise have been heard by ASAP. They do tend to vigil a lot more yeah. in here now because of what because was of seen. What yeah, yeah. And they do attach microphones to the ceiling. Yes. And the ceiling above here uh, a majority of it is not actually built on, but sitting here actually is part of our private accommodation. Yep. And noises have been heard quite a volume on this ceiling, 
and we have heard nothing upstairs. In fact, our sleep has not even been disturbed. Really? And when we've come down to let ASAP out at the end of the session, on one particular occasion, they were so concerned about the amount of noise, they thought we were going to actually come down in the middle of the night and throw them out for waking really? us up. But you'd not heard it? We'd not heard a thing. And that could be explained by the fact that the building is now only two storeys, yeah. and it used to be three, yeah. and the floor level we walk on is different to the previous floor level. So you've got that as well. Yeah. Um, just goes on, really. Yeah, in fact, <laughs> let's be quite honest with you, you're, you're custodian of a, of a very, very haunted um, coaching inn, aren't you? Simple as that. We're a custodian of, a, of a, an inn that's got a lot of things that go on in it that can't be explained, exactly, yeah, and yeah. I accept what people come and tell me. I know what I've experienced myself. I know what my, my partner's experienced, um, and I just listen and take in what other people have experienced and tell us, yeah. because it's not for me to decide whether they were drunk, out of their mind seeing things if they were the person that experienced that they want to tell me that and i have to take that at face value yeah, and um, listen. yeah, yeah. you can't do anything else lynn that's wonderful okay thanks for having today <laughs> that's all right you're welcome we've been swanning around for the best part of an hour looking for the site of the old palace hotel at burkdale which was supposed to be haunted we were about to give up and we drove down here and we saw a road called Palace Road. I stopped and asked the car park attendant and he sent me down here. All I knew was that there was a story of the lift that operated itself. Years ago when it was a hotel, the staff checked it every night because they couldn't stop it. And in the 1960s when it was being demolished, the workmen were having the same problems. But that was it until I arrived here and I saw a poem on the wall of the pub called The Fisherman's Rest. On such a night in the distant past, the surf raged high on the beach, the Mexico bark on a bank was fast, no port that night would she reach. Three lifeboats to her aid were sent, by fishermen manned with good intent. One boat returned, her crew to save, the others would drown in that terrible gale. To this place they brought them, here into rest. No man can do more than to give of his best. A nation mourned and mourning new pride, the pride of a nation. In vain they not died. Apparently this is all that's left of the old Palace Hotel. This was the bar, which is still preserved. It was to this place that the 27 bodies were brought that were found after that disaster on that terrible night of December the 9th, 1886. And they still haunt this place. To the back here, now there are houses on the site where the original Palace Hotel was built. And apparently, people still have problems, poltergeist activity in the buildings. And apparently, the architect who built the palace designed it the wrong way round and they built it apparently back to front and even he committed suicide but whether it was here i don't know but let's go inside and see if there are any more ghost stories so come and join me And we're now actually inside the pub, uh, the Fisherman's Rest. And with me, Lee, you're the, the manager. Yes, indeed. And it's just been refurbished by the looks yeah, of it. Yeah, in November. Yeah, but this was originally the vaults of the old yeah, it was palace. Yeah, public bar from the Palace Hotel. And then when the hotel was knocked down, this, this was the only part of the building that's remained and it became the Fisherman's Rest when the hotel was knocked down. Right, and what happened in here? What? Basically, the story behind the pub is that in 1886, there was a lifeboat disaster off, off sea. There was a ship called the Mexico which went down. The lifeboat crews from Lytham and from Southport were sent out yeah. to, retrieve the, to retrieve the ship. And basically, the bodies that were retrieved and brought back were laid to rest here in the pub. Hence, it's called the Fisherman's Rest. Oh, I see. And so, I mean, there were actually 27 bodies, apparently, that the, some of the killed from the Mexico, or the drowned yeah, from Mexico. Yeah, exactly. Well, it was a mixture of lifeboatmen and yeah. crew of the ships. And, and the, uh, the lifeboat, I think, was called the Eliza Fernley. It was, yes. They should have had 14 crew, but they'd made it up to 16 because they knew it was such a serious storm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And apparently only 
two survived. Two survived. There's a couple of people at the on the pictures on the wall who are the, who are the people who are They're saved. the actual survivors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crikey. And uh, what about, I mean, obviously, because it's a haunted mm -hmm. pub, isn't it, which is why we're here. Yeah. Um, what, what, has anything happened to you here? or? Not to me particularly, but old stories from the past of ex-landlords and people who've worked here have heard rumblings in the cellars and late at night chains. Really? Loads of chains and things going on. Yeah, because I mean, apparently when it was a hotel, or sorry, when they demolished the hotel in 1969, there was a huge lift, mm -hmm. a four-ton lift, that the workmen couldn't, they couldn't stop it going up and down. Um, there was no electricity in the place. Mm -hmm. They cut all the wires to the lift, and it still continued to go up and down. Mm -hmm. well, it wouldn't go sideways, would it? <laughs> Went up and down, and eventually they started pounding it with 28-pound lump hammers to try and, I suppose, pound it. To, and they did. It literally started to slide down and it crashed into what was apparently the cellars right. and um, embedded itself in there. And um, that's, that's really the story I'd heard about, which brought me here All right. today. But I didn't realise that there was such a wealth, yeah, there's a bit of history behind such it. a story behind mm -hmm. it, that actually 27 bodies were stored here and, and that we've got a, um, a disaster. Mm -hmm. Indeed. No wonder the place is as haunted as it is. Absolutely. That is fantastic. Thank you Cheers. very much indeed. Cheers. Cheers. I'm standing a stone's throw from Marble Arch, from Tyburn, where the hangings took place. I'm standing in front of the Mason's Arms, a very, very old public house. This is the actual place where the saying, I'm on the wagon, comes from. What in fact happened was on the way from the jail to the gallows, this being public of course, thousands of people watching the cart or the wagon coming along the road. Every time they came to a pub, the weight of people, the crowd, actually caused the wagon to stop. And usually the condemned would either climb down or the landlord or landlady would send out a complimentary pint of beer or wine. They would drink that and of course by the time they got to the scaffold, they were probably so drunk that it didn't bother them too much. But the last pub on the way, and this was the last pub, after this place, no more beer. I'm on the wagon. There's a sign outside here that says, the Mason's Arms situate on the site of the dungeons where prisoners were held before their hanging. A tunnel ran from the dungeons to Marble Arch, but was sealed up. The dungeons are today's pub cellar and are believed to be haunted by their earlier inhabitants, many of whom plotted abortive last-minute escapes from the tree. Here. The fittings for the unfortunate prisoners' manacles can still be seen on the cellar walls. I think we'd better go in, go down inside, and see what we can find. I know it's down here, because I've been in and done a recce. Down the old wooden stairs, down into the depths, into the bowels of the old building. All quite uh, white, modern health and safety, of course, around here. Breeze blocks, it's getting older. Brickwork now down here, and it's getting slightly darker. And here, the old original barrel vaulted archway. And this is the part they told me about. The old original bit. And here, it's been pointed out to me already, the original holes where the manacles were. But they actually held some of the prisoners here before taking them on to Tyburn. Now, of course, most of the people would have been conveyed in a cart, but they tell me that here is the original part that was only bricked up about 20 years ago. And they tell me that this literally runs all the way through, I can't see through, all the way through to Marble Art. And of course, with that huge amount of people waiting, you can probably understand why on certain occasions they actually used to take them underground in the tunnel to the gallows to avoid that huge crush of people. 
Many ghost stories to do with the building. A ghostly figure of a man has been seen wandering around here. The staff don't like coming down here alone at night. Glasses move and sometimes blow up. And often down here, when they think that the beer has run out, and they say, go and change the barrel. The staff don't go alone. Two of them come down just to find that phantom hands have actually turned off the gas. And in fact, there's plenty of beer still in the barrels. <laughs>